God is not looking at our tokens of appreciation towards him. He is looking at our hearts. He is looking at us in the dark when no one else is. This morning we are in Luke chapter 22, beginning there in verse 47. Down through 50, 53, we are examining Judas's betrayal of Jesus there in the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives. This is the night that Jesus was betrayed. It was also the night that Jesus ate the Passover meal with his disciples there in the upper room. It is there in that upper room that Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, explaining the juice and the bread, the wine and the bread as his blood and as his body, which is given for the sins of of many. They left that upper room and they came to the Mount of Olives where Jesus was betrayed. The goal of this sermon is for you to answer a question. For every person in here to answer a question for themselves. You cannot answer this for your neighbor and I would provide you with the answer, which is my custom. I would provide you with the answer, but I cannot answer this question for you. Only you, with the power of the Holy Spirit, can actually answer this question. And it's this. If you don't get anything else from this sermon, I want you to answer this question. Under the cover of darkness, who is Jesus to you? Is he someone you betray, someone you flee from, or someone you cling to? Under the cover of darkness... Who is Jesus to you? When no one is watching, when you're alone at home, when you're alone in the car, when the lights are off, or even in the quiet of your own mind, who is Jesus to you in that moment? On March 10th, 1989, there was what astronomers call a CME, a CME. That is when the sun has a disturbance on its surface and you have an explosion. You have an explosion that happens. It's almost like a solar flare. And on March 10th, 1989, there was a coronal mass ejection where there was an explosion on the sun's surface and it sent a 1 billion ton gas cloud towards the earth. And it sent it towards the earth at a million miles per hour. A million miles per hour. Two days later, that gas cloud hit earth's atmosphere and it landed right on Quebec, Canada. And when it hit Quebec, Canada there on March 12th, 1989, it caused a massive blackout. A massive power failure. And the entire city of Quebec, 6 million people were without electricity, without power for 12 hours. You know what people worry about the most when blackout occurs? They don't worry that they won't be able to use their electric razor or that the lights won't come on. Nobody worries about those things. Eventually we'll get the power going again, right? Nobody worries about those type things. But you know what everyone worries about when a blackout occurs, when there's darkness? Everyone worries about what people are going to do. Because under the cover of darkness, people do what they want to do. People are free to be anonymous. And when you feel the power to be anonymous, you feel the freedom to do exactly what your heart desires. That's why I'll contend with you this morning that under the cover of darkness, you will know exactly who you are. See, who you are is, is not who we see right now. Who you are is not who we see right now. Who you are is when you are home alone. Who you are is who you are when the lights are off. Who you are is who you are when nobody can see what's going on in here. That's who you are. And God knows who you are. That's why I ask you the question, because it's very revealing if you were to answer this question for yourself. Who, under the cover of darkness, who is Jesus to you in that moment? Is he someone that you betray? When given the opportunity, do you betray the Lord? 
do you flee from? Say, it's just too hard to follow Jesus. And if I'm given the opportunity to not be seen, I won't follow him. Or is Jesus someone that you cling to? Let's look at our text this morning and see this question arise from there. Luke chapter 22, beginning there in verse 47, says, while he, that's Jesus it is, while Jesus was still speaking, there came a crowd. And we'll stop right there for just a moment and remember what Jesus was speaking about. Remember that Jesus had left the upper room there with his disciples after the Passover meal and the Lord's Supper. The Bible tells us that they sang a hymn and then they went down the Valley Kidron and then up the Mount of Olives to the Garden of Gethsemane. And you remember what Jesus was doing there in the Garden of Gethsemane, probably the most famous of all all the prayers ever prayed, famous prayer that we read of in the Bible is where Jesus went and he prayed his prayer of agony. And he was in such grief of soul, such agony of soul that he sweat. And it says that his sweat was so great that it was as if it was great drops of blood. And here are the disciples just a few stones throw away and they are fallen asleep because of the grief and the sorrow of their soul. And you remember what Jesus tells them in verse 46 of Luke 22. He says, rise, wake up, and pray that you may not enter into temptation. Jesus had been warning his disciples of the darkness that was coming because this night was going to be the darkest night in history, eclipsed only by the darkness of the next day where the Lord Jesus himself was crucified. But this was going to be a night of deep darkness, intense darkness. And Jesus knew that temptation was going to be its strongest when things were most difficult, when things seemed most desperate. And so he tells them, you need to pray you need to stay vigilant and ask the Lord to keep you from temptation. Peter, I've already told you that Satan has demanded to sift you like wheat, literally to shake you. You need to pray that you may not enter into temptation. Because Jesus understands, God fully understands when temptation is at its strongest point for every human being. And it's at these two points, the opposite ends of the spectrum in life. You will experience the greatest temptations of your life when you are at these opposite ends of the spectrum. When you are in first, plenty. You will experience the greatest temptations of your life. When you have everything that you feel like you need, you are going to be tempted to be puffed up with pride as if your own hand garnered the things that you have. You will be tempted to flee the Lord because you don't need him in times of plenty. You remember what the Lord told Israel as he was leading them into the promised land? He said, beware, lest when you enter into the land flowing with milk and honey and you become fat on the land, you become wealthy and you rise above all the other nations, be careful lest you say, my hand has done this. Because the Lord understands when you have what you need, you will be tempted to forget who gave it to you. Well, the opposite end of the spectrum is true just as well. When you are without, when you are in times of desperation, when you are in times of deep darkness, you will be tempted to resort to your resourcefulness. You will be tempted to do whatever you want to do. Finish this. Desperate times call for... Now, okay, there we go. You will be tempted greatest in times of deep darkness. So what does Jesus tell the disciples to do? He says, you need to stay in the middle. You need to stay watchful and vigilant in prayer, always praying that the Lord keep you from temptation. And as he is telling them these things, it says there came a crowd. There came a crowd. Now the ESV leaves out a word here, and I'm unsure why because I think that they are wrong. But in the Greek text, there is a word there in between that first and second phrase while he was still speaking. There's a word that comes up, and it's the word edu. Edu. They count it as some sort of transition, just moving to the next thing. But almost everywhere else in the New Testament, edu is translated as behold, look, 
It's exclamatory. It draws your attention to the scene changing. And the time for talk is now over. That's why I'm pointing it out to you, because the scene changes drastically. Jesus is warning them, you better pray, things are getting dark. You better pray, things are getting dark. And guess what? Jesus already knew the crowd was on its way, and the lights were starting to go out. Things were dark. And then he says, behold, there came a crowd And the man called Judas. Now, your text may say crowd. It may say mob. If it says mob, it's translated rightly as well because this crowd was a large group of people with sword and club and torch in hand. This crowd was not there to hear the teachings of Jesus. This crowd was there to apprehend Jesus. They were here to take him by force, to seize him by force. There came a crowd, and the man called Judas. Notice how Luke distances himself and the rest of the apostles, says, the man, that, that guy, that Judas, not one of us, that Judas. And the man called Judas, one of the 12, that is shocking, says one of the 12 was leading them. Judas, one of the 12, one of those who had been called by name by the Lord Jesus himself, called to follow after him. He walked with the Lord for three plus years, ate dinner, lunch, and breakfast with the Lord, went, to, went with the Lord through all of his journeys, through all of his difficulties, witnessed the miracles, witnessed the feeding of the 5,000. In fact, he's one of the ones passing out the bread and the fish. And then afterwards he eats. That Judas, one of the 12. And what I want you to see is this, that though Judas was of the number of the 12, he was no more born again. He was no more in relationship with Jesus than the devil himself. There's a shocking point that arises from this. That association saves no person. Your mother or your grandmother or your daddy, they may be the most godly person you know. And they may indeed be godly and they may indeed pray for you on a daily basis. But you understand this, you will not go to heaven because they pray. You are not counted righteous because of any person's righteousness. You will be counted righteous not by association with another person. You are counted righteous by your faith in Jesus. Judas knew Jesus. He knew of Jesus. But he had never surrendered to the lordship of Jesus. And he was no more born again than the devil himself. Do not rest on your laurels that because you go to church, you think that you're going to go to heaven. That's not the biblical requirement for salvation. Don't rest on the thought that because you are surrounded by Christians or you're surrounded by people who seem to be decent, God-fearing people, that does not get you into heaven. True faith in Jesus where you surrender to his lordship, that is the kind of faith that God recognizes and accounts as righteousness to you. You are not saved by your association any more than Judas was. What you do with Jesus personally matters. I can't answer that for you either. Each person in here must answer that for themselves. What have I done with Jesus? Who is Jesus to me? Now look at the text. Verse 47 says, he drew near to Jesus to kiss him, to kiss him. As I read this and I studied this this week, I had to ask myself the question, why did Judas need to kiss Jesus? Kiss him there on the cheek as a a friend, as as a greeting of love? Why did Judas need to kiss the Lord Jesus? And I came away with three understandings here of why Judas kissed Jesus. First, the Gospel of Mark records for us that Judas had communicated with the soldiers, with those men with the clubs and the swords and the torches. He communicated with them that I am going to point out the man that you are to seize. And when I kiss him, that's the signal. That's the go-ahead. This is our plan to betray Jesus. So very plainly, very elementary, Judas was giving away the Lord Jesus. That was his signal to these soldiers. Secondly, 
Judas kissed Jesus because it speaks to the fact that Jesus looked like everyone else. Jesus looked like Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Peter probably looked like all the other Galilean men. Jesus looked like all the other men from Nazareth. He looked like all the other Jews in that day. He looked no different than them. The appeal of Jesus was not his beauty. It was not his looks. The appeal of Jesus was that he was the Son of God, clothed in the likeness of men. But he looked just like all of us. Just a man. But not just a man. He's the Son of God, clothed in flesh. Isaiah The prophet Isaiah, hundreds of years before Jesus came, he prophesied about the suffering servant. And in Isaiah 53, beginning there in verse 2, this is what Isaiah said that the Messiah would look like. He said, he had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. The third reason that Judas kissed Jesus that night was because it was dark outside. You say, oh, that seems very elementary, very basic understanding, but there's a lot to be seen in that understanding. Judas kissed Jesus because it was dark that night. That's why these men were carrying torches. You see, when we go outside at nighttime, you're hardly ever in a place where it is completely dark because we have so many lights powered by electricity nowadays. But in those days, there was no electricity. If you were going to have have light after the sun went down, it was going to come by a flame. And I don't imagine there were too many flames other than maybe the fire burning there to keep them warm that gave off light. That's why this monster was carrying torches and so they come here under the cover of darkness now Judas and the scribes and the Pharisees and chief priests had planned to betray Jesus under the cover of darkness at nighttime away from all the other people because remember they were trying to avoid a riot Remember that at this point, the crowds are reeling over Jesus. They love Jesus because he's feeding their bellies. He's healing their sick. He's performing the miracles. He is a man of the people, and he is God among men, and they are following him. Remember that six days before this, Jesus had raised Lazarus from the dead, and Lazarus had traveled to Jerusalem with Jesus, and all these people are able to see Lazarus. When the Scribes and the elders and the chief priests in the temple found out that Jesus raised Lazarus. You know what they wanted to do? They wanted to kill not only Jesus to quiet this threat, they wanted to put Lazarus to death as well. So they were plotting. They were seeking out a way, a place, a time to kill Jesus where they could be away from all these people and do it quietly and not stir up a riot. That's one of the reasons why they did it under the cover of darkness. The second, and I think the most profound reason that Judas did this under cover of darkness is because he operates just in the same way that sinners operate. People like to sin under the cover of darkness because darkness provides something for every one of us, doesn't it? Darkness provides anonymity. That's why people are so mean. Think of this. That's why people are so mean on the Internet. Do you ever think about that? That's why people are so mean on the internet. They get on message boards and things like this and can create a fake profile, an anonymous profile. And guess what you can do when that happens? You can say whatever you want to say. You can do whatever you want to do. When the lights go out in a blackout, what are people worried about again? They're worried about what people will do because under the cover of darkness, when you can be anonymous and nobody knows it's you, you think you can get away with anything. I heard a theologian talking on his radio show not too long ago, just a couple of weeks, and he made a very astute point. He said, you know the issue with road rage is this. People who have road rage get really mad behind the wheel when they're driving, especially when they're in their car alone. You know why people do that, he said? 
He said people do that because that vehicle provides them a certain level of anonymity. That vehicle gives them a platform, where they, a little bubble, in essence, where they can scream, they can yell, they can say whatever they want to say, they can throw things, they can do whatever they want to do, and nobody knows you apart from all the other drivers. But you know what? Who you are under the cover of darkness, who you are in that little bubble called the car, who you are anonymously on the internet, who you are at home alone by yourself, that is who you are. The cover of darkness reveals to you who you really are. Judas operates in the darkness because he's a rat. Look at what Judas does here. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him. Verse 48. But Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Notice that there is a, a sound of shock in Jesus' voice here. Would you betray the Son of Man? Judas, you know what you're doing here. You're not just betraying an ordinary man here. You are betraying the Son of Man, the, the, Son of man, the one prophesied by the prophet Daniel that would come into the world as God's anointed one, the one who would sit on the throne of David forever. Judas, you know that I am the Son of God, and yet you are going to betray me. He says, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man, the Son of God, with a king? Yes. Shock that Judas would use such a symbol to betray him. Matthew Henry said this about this text. He said that Judas used the badge of friendship as the instrument of treachery. He used the badge of friendship as the instrument of treachery. Judas kissed him on the cheek as though he were a friend. What does it say in Proverbs? Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. And here's Judas kissing Jesus on the cheek. A badge of friendship, a badge of love. In fact, he even said, greetings, rabbi. <laughs> greetings, teacher. He has all the symbols of affection, but he does not have a heart of submission, does he? It is possible Listen to this, please. It is possible to fake the symbols of affection for God. Judas does it right here, doesn't he? He kisses God on the cheek, and he faked the whole thing. It is possible to fake the symbols of affection for God. Understand this, that we can come to church we can sing songs, we can clap our hands, we can lift our hands, we can bow our knees, close our eyes, and bow our head most reverently. And we can do all of that fraudulently. We can fake the symbols of affection for God. You know what God looks at? Your heart. <laughs> Look at what he says to Judas. Judas comes up to greet him. Greetings, Rabbi! And he kisses him on the cheek, and Jesus says, I know exactly what you're doing, Judas. Would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Do you think I don't realize what you're doing, Judas? How much more must God say that to us when we fake the symbols of affection for God? When we raise our hands after our hands have done God knows what. Peter says, lifting holy hands to God. In Matthew chapter 15, verse 8, Jesus quotes the prophet Isaiah, and he says, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. How true of Judas is this? Judas is not only speaking words of praise, he even gives him the symbols of affection, kisses him on the cheek, but he doesn't honor him with his heart. His heart is far from him. Understand this. This is crucial. The symbols of affection 
without the heart of submission are the signs of deepest betrayal. The fake kiss, the fake hug, the fake I love you. The symbols of affection without the heart of submission are the signs of deepest betrayal. This is why Jesus says in Matthew 7, 21, he says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. I'm not listening to the words of your mouth. I'm not listening to the symbols of your affection. I'm not looking at the badge of friendship that you try to hand me, God says. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father. God is not looking at our tokens of appreciation towards him. He is looking at our hearts. He is looking at us in the dark when no one else is. He is looking at the quietness, the stillness of our mind when we have complete anonymity before men, but we are completely naked before God. May it not be said of you, this man, this woman, this child honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Under the cover of darkness, who is Jesus to you? Is he someone that you betray? Is he someone that you flee from? Or is he someone that you cling to? Now look at this. This gets really, really interesting here. Verse 49 says, And when those who were around him, that's the disciples, the apostles here, and when those who were around him saw what would follow, they, they look at the crowd, they look at this mob with torches and clubs and swords in hand, and they see this is going to get ugly. And you could see them maybe even drop back into a crouched position, ready to do something. When those who were around him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. John chapter 18 tells us who that one person is. John chapter 18 tells us also who that soldier was who got his ear lopped off that night. John tells us that it was Peter. It was Peter who drew the sword. And it was Peter who struck the servant named Malchus. Malchus is the one who had his ear lopped off that night. Think about this for a moment. <laughs> Peter's a fisherman, okay? Okay. He's not a soldier by any means. And if any text proves that, it's this one. Do you think that Peter was aiming for this man's ear? Anybody? I don't think Peter had it in his mind. I'm going to take this sword out, and I'm going to cut your ear off and show you who's boss. You know what Peter's thinking here? I am going to decapitate this man. Pretty tense situation, isn't it? Such a situation, Peter is thrown into such a mad, frantic panic that he is ready to kill. And he has every aim to kill, he just has bad aim. But make no mistake, Peter means to kill here. So look at 49 and 50 together. This is very interesting. And when those who were around him saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Huh. There's something missing there. Something missing between verse 49 and verse 50. Let's read it again slowly and I'll point it out. And when those who were around him saw what would follow, they said, here's the question. Lord, shall we strike with the sword? Verse 50, you see, and one of them struck. What's missing there? You have a question, you have action, but what you don't have is an answer. You have the disciples saying, Lord, should we kill? Well, let's do it. They don't actually wait on an answer. Understand this, because we fall into this trap all the time. We pray about things... And we ask God, Lord, would you lead me in this? Lord, would you give me guidance in this? Would you answer my question here? Would you tell me what to do? And then we say amen and say, well, I guess I'm ready to go do it. What was missing? There's no answer. 
We don't know what God wants us to do because a lot of times we pray and we think that prayer is the end. Prayer is not the end. Prayer is the beginning. Prayer is me asking God, Lord, what do you want me to do? And then I wait. And when the Lord speaks, then I act. The point of prayer is to do what God wants us to do. It's not for us to do what we want to do. Which the simple point of application for us is this. Don't move before the Lord speaks. When you pray, say your prayer and then let God speak. I had this thought run through my mind as I was studying this. That it's hard to walk in obedience when you jump to conclusions, isn't it? It's hard to walk in obedience when you're just jumping to conclusions. You know what they call that when you try to walk and jump at the same time? They call that skipping, don't they? And that's exactly what happens when you jump to conclusions. You skip everything that God wants you to do. And here's the disciples saying, Lord, what do you want us to do? Well, we'll just make up our mind on our own, and I'm going to try to cut this servant's head off. But aren't you thankful, Peter? Peter, aren't you thankful that you missed? I sure am thankful that Peter missed here. I'm sure Malchus was very thankful at this point. So Peter goes to cut this man's head off, lops his ear off. The disciples in a frantic panic, ready to kill. But look at verse 51. It says, but Jesus, but Jesus said, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed them. He touched his ear and he healed him. Here you have a contrast, don't you? between the disciples' frantic panic, ready to kill these sinners, and here you have Jesus showing mercy on this undeserving sinner. Here you have Peter and the disciples ready to make war, and here you have Jesus bringing peace. Here you have Jesus fulfilling the very commands that he commanded us in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5 and 6, where he said, pray for those who persecute you. And spitefully use you. And he commanded us to turn the other cheek. And he says, love your enemy. Here's Jesus picking up the ear of Malchus and reinstating it on his head. Restoring this man in an instant. You see, Jesus' point here is he is not here to make war on sinners. Jesus was not there at that point to kill sinners. Jesus is there at that point to atone for sinners. Jesus is there to provide salvation for Malchus, not end his life. So Jesus says, no more of this. That's an imperative, a command. Stop it. I'm not here to kill these men. I'm here to die for them. I'm here to give myself for them. That's the first thing that Jesus showed in his miracle here. Jesus showed his mercy to an otherwise undeserving sinner. Someone who came to apprehend Jesus. And yet this man, think of what must have been running through Malchus's mind. As he lay there on the ground with his ear healed and the blood still probably on his face and his shirt. Thinking, I came to apprehend this man. Yet what I came to find is that he is the most gracious person I have ever met. He is the most merciful person. That's not the only thing that Jesus proved there in this situation as he healed Malchus. The second thing he proved, Jesus proved that he has power here. Jesus has the power to heal a man with the touch of his hand. And this is the point, that a man with the power to heal with the mere touching of his hand does not get taken by force. He either goes willingly or he does not go. This is the Lord of all in the garden that night. You don't take him by force. But here's Jesus showing mercy, demonstrating his power, and yet you'll also find that he is going to yield to the Father's plan. And he's going to hand himself over into the hands of lawless men. Verse 52, Then Jesus said to the chief priests and the officers of the temple and the elders who had come out against him, Have you come out against a robber? 
with swords and clubs. He says, you know me better than this. You know that I'm not a mere criminal. What does he say? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. You know my character. You know that I'm without sin, and yet you come out against me as though I were some sort of thief, as though I were a criminal. Jesus was numbered with the transgressors, but Jesus was innocent, and these men knew it. They knew his character. He had been in the temple daily, preaching to them and teaching them about God. They know that what they are doing is wicked. Look at the end of verse 53. He says, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Jesus issues a statement here, yielding himself into their hands, giving himself over to them so that they can do as they please, and they will. They will mock him, beat him, crucify him, and he will be dead. He yields himself into their hands, but only for an hour. He says, but this is your hour. Understand this, that these men had a short time to do whatever they pleased with Jesus. For a short time, God would humble himself before man. For a short time, Jesus would give himself over to men to do whatever they would please, but that hour is over. That hour is no more. Jesus does not kneel before anyone in this room or anyone on this planet, living or dead. Jesus is Lord of all. The Bible tells us furthermore that because Jesus humbled himself here in this moment, here in these days, is crucified the next day, that God raised him up from the dead and gave him the name that proves that he will never bow his knee to another person by giving him the name of Lord and every knee would bow in heaven and earth and under the earth earth and declare that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. They get but an hour. And in three days, Jesus would be raised from the dead, vindicating him as righteous and seating himself there at the right hand of God the Father. Just as Jesus was appointed an hour, understand this. Every single person in this room has an hour appointed to them. God appoints the time of your departure. God appoints the time of your death and my death as well. Every single one of us has an appointment with with this Jesus. And what you personally do with Jesus is what matters. Will you be like Judas and say, I hear about Jesus, I see the good works, I hear the good words about Jesus, but in the hour of darkness, under the cover of darkness, to me, Jesus is someone worth betraying. Or Jesus is someone worth fleeing. You know Judas immediately regretted that decision. The Bible tells us that the next day, Judas regretted the decision so much that he ended his own life. What you do with Jesus matters for eternity. And you may have come here this morning and you may have been resting on your laurel saying, well, I go to church every week. I'm a good churchman. I was raised in church. Daddy's a godly man. Mama's a godly woman. Grandma's been praying for me all the time. But you, you are the one who asked to answer the question under the cover of darkness, who am I really? Do I betray Jesus on a daily basis and say, oh, well, or is Jesus the one that I cling to? This morning, you have to decide personally what you will do with Jesus. Christian, believer, understand this. What you do in the darkness matters. What you do in the night matters. What you do when you have the opportunity to be anonymous matters. So even you have to answer the question, under the cover of darkness, who is Jesus to you? Is he someone that you betray? Is he someone you flee from or is he someone that you cling to? Can you pray with me?